excited about this. Um, it's really good to have had Stephen O'Shea and Jonathan talk about what they talked about because this kind of fits, uh, fits right into that. You know, the lines of thought that they have presented uh, fits right into that even though we are moving away from Europe and Middle East into the Far East. Uh, first of all, my personal background, uh, I'm Jason Campbell, of course, I'm the deacon here, and I was raised in uh, Southern Buddhist tradition. So what it means is that it's, you know, uh, I, was, I grew up in Burma, so Burma, Thailand, and a couple of other countries are in the Southern Buddhist tradition, which is um, more or less orthodox trend of Buddhism. Uh, that is very close to the early schools of Buddhism. In, con in contrast to the northern part, uh, which you know, includes China, Japan, Korea, Vietnam, Tibet, places like that, which has more developed and assimilated kind of uh, philosophies within uh, that tradition. And the goals for the reason that I'm bringing up Buddhism is because, uh, you know, when Gnosticism and early Christianity go far east, and there are some ideas that they have to tackle in relation to the Buddhist thought, which has already prevalent in those areas. And I am also ethnically Chinese, so I grew up more or less familiar with uh, the Chinese morality, Chinese ethics, you know, that is inherited through uh, Taoism and uh, Confucianism that are passed down in my family. So the goals of this presentation is to, uh, we talk a lot about Middle East, the Jewish people, the, uh, you know, European expansion of Christianity, and then the Crusades and things like that, and we will shift those gears a little bit to go east and see what happened uh, to Gnosticism and early Christianity in those areas. And to also to illustrate the idea, you know, the idea of uh, fluidity of those ideas, uh, spirituality schools of thoughts like uh, Jonathan has already explained. And, um, you know, also to make sure that everybody's interested in uh, do more research because I cannot cover everything here. Uh, this will just be a very tip of the iceberg. And uh, the fourth, of course, that came uh, when Jonathan was talking uh, earlier, uh, another purpose I would say that is that, you know, Christianity as we know it today is very different from the Christianity uh, that happened uh, in the early stages. And nowadays, when we think about Christianity, we think about uh, the death and resurrection and the atonement of sins through the de de uh, death of Christ. But earlier times, that may or may not be um, a prominent idea for certain groups of people, and that certainly got carried over into the East as well. So that's an introduction to my introduction. Um, let's see. So, when I chose this topic, it was a little longer, uh, it had a, a little longer title called Early Christianity and Gnosticism in the Far East. But uh, when I see Gnosticism here, it is, I'm using it in a very loose way. Uh, one, 
uh, I will talk a lot about the Church of the East, uh, which is um, Nestorian Church. Nestorian, Nestoria is one of the people that we uh, honor in our liturgy, uh, but he is not explicitly Gnostic in the sense that Simon Magus or Valentinus were coined uh, to be Gnostic. And then Manichaeanism, uh, Jonathan and Sivin O'Shea both have touched on Manichaeanism. It's uh, a very uh, explicitly Gnostic uh, school of thought that came after Gnosticism. I will touch on that as well. And when I say Far East, I'm not talking about all the countries in the Far East. I'm talking about specifically China and specifically during the Tang Dynasty, which is uh, between 618 to uh, 907 of our time. So Imperial China, uh, that time, talking about two specific groups of um, Christian and Gnostic groups. So, context. Um, so I'll go to this map first. <clears throat> so this is a tremendously important idea to, for us to look at because this is the Silk Road and Silk Road, Road is where uh, major civilizations in ancient time come together to exchange goods, trade, and ideas. Uh, so when Jonathan was talking about and discussing where the ideas come, whether you know, ideas are linear or not. Uh, this is an important picture that, that I was just thinking about as well. So in the East, there is China, which has its own culture, its own uh, civilization and philosophy and ideas. Um, and then India has its own very unique uh, culture and philosophy. And then Persia is also a very, uh, you know, advanced civilization at one point. And then there is uh, Arabia is that time, that period that we are touching on, it's not really a big uh, civilization uh, as we know it yet. It's more of a nomadic uh, time. And then there's Judea and the Roman, Roman and Greco-Roman influences over here. So these, this is a map that we can come uh, again and again back, uh, you know, how ideas have flown from east to the west and west to the east and so on. <clears throat> and the period that we're touching on is Tang Dynasty. It is uh, one of the most cosmopolitan and prosper time, prosperous time in imperial Chinese history lasted for nearly 300 years. And uh, the, uh, you know, before that prosperous time, China, um, you know, the area that we know chi as China nowadays, is had centuries of uh, a couple of dynastic changes. There are different uh, areas fighting for hegemony, and then people were uh, in turmoil. Uh, and that is interesting to think back what Stephen O'Shea was talking about. You know, the when you look at the you know his, history and geography of things, when changes are happening, when uh, world and turmoil are happening, uh, people can feel the human condition even more. And that can lead to emergence of new spiritual ideas or philosophy or re-emergence re of those ideas, which I'll illustrate uh, a little bit later again as well. So before that, uh, before Tang Dynasty, there's Han Dynasty, um, about four, four centuries before, which was uh, also very prosperous. And it started from 202 BC to uh, 220 CE. And during Han Dynasty, the Silk Road 
was already there. So Silk Road was, was already there, uh, 220. So Buddhism is also well established in uh, India. And then uh, there are some uh, speculation or hypotheses that you know, some of the uh, Buddhist uh, teachers and monks might have trouble west to Alexandria or uh, you know the uh, Middle East to Mediterranean area and uh, Silk Road actually uh, was uh, sort of disturbed during the uh, the split kingdoms o over the next 400 years but reopened during the Tang uh, imperial time. So here is a very interesting, well, what I think is a very interesting chart that I, I'm really proud of. Um, so here is, you know, before 100 CE, Han Empire is already here. I would say that Buddhism, uh, Judaism, Christianity, early Christianity are already here. And this timeline compares, uh, you know, across Europe and Asia, what kinds of things are happening uh, in relation to the topic that we're talking about. So the first thing, of course, this is the years, uh, 100 to 200, 300 uh, of our time. And then this, the first timeline is uh, Imperial China. The second timeline is the uh, Greco-Roman period. And then the third is the Persian uh, area, so now current Iran. And then this is India, or somewhere near India and uh, current day Afghanistan. And then this is Central Asia, uh, Western China nowadays. So if you look at that, these things, these all things are happening. And we need to consider, you know, with a Silk Road, and with these things, they at least knew each other a little bit. Of course, the Persians and the Romans uh, knew each other a little bit more than the, the Han Chinese and the Roman people. But at the same time, there are some records, um, talk, you know, Chinese records talking about people from the far west called Da Qing. And Qing is a reference to uh, the Qing Empire that came before the Han Empire. So they're equating and calling the Roman Empire as if, uh, as if an, in reference to the first very empire of China. Uh, so if you look at these things, um, you know, the flow of ideas, the flow of uh, various spiritualities can be seen here. So in the Han Empire, there is Confucianism, obviously, which is, you know, which is primarily a social ethical system uh, with, uh, with a focus on good governance and with a focus on uh, social protocol. And then there's Taoism, which uh, is more of a mystical spirituality or uh, Taoism is very big, so it can go from stoic, you know, stoic-like uh, philosophy to a more esoteric and uh, mystical philosophy. So those two ideas are there. And uh, in the middle of this Han period, of course, Buddhism came from India and become really assimilated into the local culture to become Chinese Buddhism. And then in the Roman Empire, there, there is the various kinds of paganism and different cults, which uh, later, you know, the Roman Empire later become Christianized, and then the successor Byzantine Empire is also Christianized. Parthian and Sasanian uh, empires, uh, they are Persian, and their state religion was Zoroastrianism, and then that area was uh, later absorbed into uh, Muslim caliphate. And then around the uh, South Asian or Indian <clears throat> subcontinent, we have the Kushan Empire, which has, which uh, 
has the elements of the post-Alexandrian. So Alexander conquered the near India, and there is a lot of um, adaptation from the Hellenic culture, as well as the emergent Buddhist um, culture. So there is the Greek Buddhists who are in the northern tradition of Buddhist. Um, and then there's Hinduism, of course. So in that, here are some key elements that happened in the history of religion. So around uh, 200, early 200s, uh, Prophet Mani of Manichaeism was born. And then um, about 200 years later, Nestorius was born. Um, and right around the time of Nestorius' birth, Augustine, our guy, uh, converted from Manichaeanism to uh, Catholicism, and he contributed very much into the development of the concepts, you know, major Roman Catholic concepts like the original sin. Um, but, and, you know, if we move along the timeline, um, I will go into the ideas of the Church of the East uh, a little bit more deeply as well. Here, Alopan, a Syriac monk, uh, a Syriac bishop uh, from the Church of the East in uh, Syria. He went along the Silk Road and ended up in the capital city of Tang, uh, Tang Empire. And that time, uh, you know, he started his community there and uh, presented to the emperor about the teachings of the church. And, uh, you know, that emperor at that time uh, was uh, religiously tolerant and uh, he granted the, the people to practice their religion, uh, granted patronage and things like that. And... Uh, the, the Church of the East flourished in the Tang, Tang Empire a little bit. And mostly, though, it's for the Persian immigrants who are in the empire. And uh, around that time, Islam emerged, emerged in uh, the Arabian Peninsula. Um, and uh, in the middle of 700s, uh, the Uyghur. Uyghurs are the Turkic people in the western part of China. Uh, the ruler of the Uyghurs converted to Manichaeanism. And that became probably the only Gnostic uh, state religion uh, for a period of time in the Uyghur Empire. That was an interesting piece. Um, you know, later in the 700s, the the uh, doctrines about the Church of the East was erected in uh, Tang, China, as well, to you know to talk about that as a commemoration. Um, those things were during the time of the communities flourishing in China. However, uh, there is always the persecution, of course, and later. In mid 800s, Emperor Wu Song, that time, uh, started persecuting the foreign religions. Uh, it started out as an anti Buddhist because Buddhism came from India and uh, it, it is technically a foreign religion to the Tang Empire. But you know, people like the Christians and Manichaeans and all the other people are also persecuted. Um, primarily, you know, you have heard this story. The Tang Empire is expanding. They were fighting. Uh, there is also a lot of religious people due to prosperity and things like that. Um, so there's a lot of tax-exempt land and there's tax-exempt wealth that is to be seized. Um, so there's the persecution, a lot of monks and nuns, whether it is Buddhist or Christian or Manichaean or whatever, uh, are secularized, you know, become uh, lay people, 
so that they can go back to work and uh, pay taxes. Uh, it is, yeah, it's, it's a story that we have heard in Europe as well. So here's an interesting map. This is a little later. Um, you know, if you look at that, here is Manichaeanism, Taoism, and Confucianism over here. We have the Buddhism and Hinduism over here, and then the influence of Islam uh, in the 800s, and then Christianity um, in Europe and um, Ethiopia. So, so what is there in Tang? Uh, Tang Empire. I've talked about uh, Taoism and uh, Confucianism, and those are, of course, the, the, the prominent uh, ideas. And there's Tang also saw a great emergence of Buddhism, Mahayana Buddhism, at that time. So even though Buddhism is technically a foreign uh, religion, it has become really assimilate to be really Chinese. And uh, during the golden age of philosophy, so it is, you know, you can think of it as the um, Greek philosoph philosophical period that we talk about and have so many people talking to each other. Uh, there was a period uh, in China as well. Uh, one of them, there are two periods, success, you know, one after the other. One is the spring and autumn period, which is very feudalistic and uh, confederated period of time where there are dukes and kingdoms which may or may not be fighting, which may or may not be friends, um, and there are a lot of people moving about different kingdoms to uh, do philosophy and teach and things like that. And then, of course, you know, because it is uh, a lot of confederacy and little kingdoms, they started fighting more openly, and that is the Warren States period. And Warren States period is the time when uh, Dao Te Ching, uh, the book of Taoism, is composed, uh, even though it's attributed to one single person, Lao Tzu. Uh, it is uh, said to be, you know, historians think that it is composed little by little, just like our Bible. Um, and compile into that. And the, initially, the Taoist thought is that you know, there are so many things happening um, because of war and things like that, and uh, Taoism uh, encouraged people to quote unquote go with the flow and to, uh, you know, to, to enjoy life as is. And um, Confucianism also emerged during the warring states to address the human condition of this suffering. And, and Confu Confucius, of course, uh, has a, or has or had a different idea how to solve that. He thinks that you know, he looks back at, quote unquote, a golden age called Zhou Dynasty which happened you know, before spring and autumn period, where you know, people <coughs> act uh, in consistency with their social status uh, as well as their duties. So uh, kings will be kings, princes will be princes, uh, fathers will be fathers, sons will be sons, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So he prescribed you know, that harmony in the social relationships and um, <coughs> to follow the rules, to follow more or less rigid rules. Um, so that's, that's one of the major thoughts. And there are, of course, other schools of thoughts uh, that came and went, but uh, probably didn't have as much influence as these two. Uh, and Buddhism arrived to China uh, through the Silk Road during the Han Dynasty period. And uh, the form of Buddhism that was um, brought to China was the Northern China Buddhism, Mahayana Buddhism, which the main premise or the main goal of Mahayana Buddhism 
is to encourage everybody to strive to become a Buddha instead of just become enlightened as a disciple, to become a Buddha oneself, you know, not, and to become a Buddha is a hard, difficult task, and it might take so many lifetimes, uh, but that is the uh, encouragement of Mahayana Buddhism. So it requires people to become monks and nuns and recite and fast and do all, all those kinds of things. And there, there is that conflict with the traditional Confucian idea where uh, a person needs to be a householder, get a wife, produce kids, and you know, support the state, support the family, be filial to your elders, things like that. So that is the later contention about that happened in that uh, persecution period as well. Um, you know, ph philosophical uh, conflict in addition to the uh, tax conflict. So I will touch on Church of the East and the Manichaean uh, group. So the Church of the East is uh, <clears throat> said to be founded by St. Thomas. They use Syriac or Aramaic uh, as their liturgical language. Um, and you know, it is a very uh, traditional old Orthodox form of liturgy. Uh, very similar to Greek Orthodox, Russian Orthodox, Arabic Orthodox uh, forms of liturgy. Um, so our Theocletian rite is also very, uh, the, the format is similar to that Orthodox liturgy, and you can compare that to, uh, to that rite for, you know, to have a feel of that. And the, structurally, it is a, uh, patriarchal structure, patriarchal as in it is headed by a patriarch, um, not patriarch as in it's a male chauvinist. Uh, ancient Christian communities, uh, and then it sort of diverged from the Western side of um, Christianity uh, around the time of Nostarius, um, you know, as people are developing. Uh, more per particular thoughts of uh, schools within the larger Christian community. Um, and what made Nostarius different from the other Christ Christians is on the nature of Christ, um, you know, Christology, what uh, is he human, is he divine, how human is he, how divine is he. So those are the issues that were uh, largely de debated. So, when it when uh, Bishop Aloban and Church of the East came over to um, China, they produced a couple of texts and uh, writings and whatnot, and. There are two major sources. One is what is commonly called as uh, Nestorian Stele, or Xi'an Stele. Xi'an is where it was found and located. Uh, it is the monument that I was just talking about where the basic doctrines of the church were written uh, by uh, a priest called Adam, uh, or his Chinese name is Jing Jing. And then there is another group of texts that are discovered in uh, a cave called Dongguan, which I think is Western China. Uh, it was rediscovered back in uh, 1900s, uh, you know, sort of similar to the discovery that we made in the Dead Sea, Qumran, and Nakamari, and places like that. So that compilation of texts had things like uh, Taoist texts, Buddhist texts, as well as Manichaean and um, uh, Nestorian Christian texts, and they are commonly, you know, in popular culture, they are called Jesus Sutras. Um, so these two sources are to address the uh, spiritual questions that are important to, you know, not 
one explain it to the emperor uh, and the population to you know receive and maintain the royal patronage as well as to uh, address certain spiritual questions so in those texts uh, I will go on go into those ideas a little bit but I will not cover everything, just a disclaimer, so we'll need to uh, do the homework later. So in those texts, what you will see is the comparison between salvation versus uh, enlightenment, resurrection versus reincarnation, sin versus the karmic consequences, the world versus the samsara. Um, so samsara is, uh, you know, come from Hinduism and Buddhism, which is the... Um, the cycle of death and rebirth that happens because of our actions or lack thereof. So here is a side note for for Chinese. <clears throat> uh, Chinese, there there's so many words for Christianity in Chinese. Uh, nowadays there are a couple of things that we use. Uh, usually Ji Du Jiao, uh, literally meaning uh, religion of Christ is a common word for Christianity. You know, Jidu is sort of uh, transliteration. But more specifically, we call Catholics Tian Zhu Jiao, which means uh, religion of the Heavenly Lord. And then there is the Eastern Orthodox Church, which is Dong Zhang Jiao. Uh, the, it's a literal translation of Eastern Orthodoxy. And then Jidu uh, Xinjiao, which is the Protestantism or New Christianity. <laughs> but in the classical times, so before you know contemporary times, uh, they had more interesting names, in my opinion, for Christianity and whatnot. Uh, so the the Church of the East, the Nestorian Church of the East, was called uh, Jinjiao, which literally means uh, luminous religion or illustrious religion. So it's not a reference to uh, Christ or Jesus or uh, a person per se, but more of the nature of that religion. And it's also called Da Qing Jinjiao. Uh, like I said, Da Qing is a reference to Rome. Uh, also, looking back into the first empire uh, China had, uh, so it's the illustrious religion from Rome, or illustrious religion from the empire, quote-unquote empire. So that's an interesting name. And then Manichaeanism nowadays is called Moni Jiao, just to uh, you know, make a reference to Moni, Mani, Prophet Mani. But it, it was also called Ming Jiao, which is uh, religion of light. So they're sort of semantically similar, but different words to talk about different groups. Here's my, okay. So this is a Nestorian stele. It's erected over there. It is now in Berlin, I think. And then this is the very head of that, uh, that stele. So here it, it writes, uh, the the memorial erected to the propagation of the illustrious religion from Rome uh, in the Middle Kingdom. So this the title, and then talked about uh, the specifics of the uh, religious ideas. So one phrase that I thought is really interesting in the very beginning of that stele. It's talking about God, the deity. So here, uh, in the English translation, uh, one person, one scholar translated it as our eternal true Lord God, triune and mysterious substance. Uh, if, uh, if we break it down, it's really uh, interesting to me because it's, you know, they're using the classical Chinese, which is much more compact than uh, current vernacular Chinese. Um, so my three in one mysterious sub substance, a mysterious body, literal body, uh, you know, without the beginning, 
the true Lord, Aloha. Aloha, uh, it's, of course, Aloha for, uh, in Syriac, Syriac for God, uh, comparable to Muslim name for God, which is Allah. Um, so, sort of like a proper name, a uh, uh, first name for God. They definitely transliterated some of the Syriac words into Chinese characters as well in certain parts, but most of these concepts were uh, translated, um, fitting to the cultural places. So I will touch on three pieces uh, of the stealing. So creation, the fall, and the redemption. Uh, so this is one translation. Um, this is talk. It talks about the the nature of God, and then he appointed the cross as the mean for determining the four cardinal points. He moved the original spirit and produced two principles of nature. The somber void was changed, and heaven and earth were opened out. The sun and moon revolved, and the day and night commenced. Having perfected all inferior objects, he then made the first man. Upon him he bestowed an excellent disposition, giving him in charge the government of all created beings. Man acting out in the original principles of his nature was pure and, and ostentatious. Uh, his unsullied and expensive mind was free from the least inordinate desire. This is, of course, the recap of Genesis. Uh, and like I said, Nestorian, the Church of the East, you know, developed its own theology before Augustine. So is there, you know, you can notice some of the differences that we will touch on later. Uh, and also keep in mind that this is also uh, a later work of the Nestorian people who are already in China for a century or so. So there is some difference already the, from you know, a more Western or more uh, Persian side of the church. And <clears throat> so originally, human beings are pure until Satan introduced the seeds of falsehood to deteriorate his purity of principle, opening thus uh, commencing his virtue gradually enlarged. And by the crevice of his nature was obscure and rendered vicious, hence 365 sects followed each other in continuous track. Um, I don't know where it came from, but it's really interesting to see that uh, 365 sects in this Nestorian text, uh, because Abraxas um, inventing every species of doctrinal complexity, while some pointed to material objects as a source of their faith, other uh, reduced all to vacancy. So they are talking about idolatry and uh, probably atheism, even to the annihilation of two primeval principles. Some sort of called down blessings by prayer, prayers and supplications, while other, by an assumption of excellence, held themselves as superior to their fellows, their intellects and thoughts continually wavering, their minds and affections incessantly on the move, never obtained their vast desires, being exhausted and distressed, they're involved in their own heated atmosphere. So uh, people are trapped in their own mind, uh, so to speak till by an accumulation of obscurity they lost their path and after long groping in darkness they were unable to return. That's really another interesting thing about you know talking about unable to return which is very different from our conventional understanding or how we talk about Christianity nowadays. Um, but in this quote-unquote orthodox trend of Christianity they're talking about um, you know, 365 sects and uh, the uh, a person fall, the humanity falling into darkness and unable to return to their rightful place. I also like that it says that people are full of hot air. <laughs> 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 yep. 
And then how does then, of course, salvation happens? The salvation happens, our trinity being divided in nature, the illustrious and honorable Messiah, failing his true dignity, appear in the world as a man. Uh, so here we talk about incarnation, angelic powers, glad tidings. Uh, so this is the you know, gospel story uh, of the, the, the Magus uh, coming, prophecies being fulfilled. And then uh, here uh, there is the complete truth and freeing from the dross. He opened the gates of three constant principles, introducing life and uh, destroying death. He suspended the bright sun to invade the chambers of darkness, and the falsehood of the devil were thereupon de defeated. He set in motion the vessel of mercy by which to ascend to the bright mansions, whereupon rational beings were then released. Having, having thus completed the manifestation of his power in clear day, he ascended to the true station. That kind of uh, something sounds like something that Jonathan was talking about, where the you know the Christ, you know, having hanged, the shoot up as the eon to uh, you know upper heavens. So that that kind of language is there. Uh, even though, again, like I said, it, it, it comes from an orthodox tradition, quote-unquote, uh, but the ideas, I, uh, I would say, are more flexible. And um, so where the li where's the line between orthodoxy and uh, non-orthodox, heterodoxy? Um, because I think these are the images and uh, figures that people use and exchange and, uh, you know, good ways to talk about these ideas. So, uh, in those things, if you look at that, uh, there's God, man's good, and then uh, they are uh, consumed by darkness and cannot return. There's the Messiah, uh, and then Messiah helps people to get the light and ascend. Uh, so here, darkness and ignorance is uh, proposed as the basics of uh, our suffering. And uh, so I'm going to the other found, discovered texts from the cave. Uh, one of them, Sutra of the Returning to Original Nature, says this sutra offers understanding and by its light, you can know the way of peace and happiness in your heart. Kind of like, you know, all the gospel language that we hear a lot. Uh, and then it also talks about the light will come and enlighten you, and you will discover all embracing knowing the mystery which will lead to peace and happiness, and this is which enable you to transcend rebirth. Um, so here we are. We can see that it is adopting the Buddhist image of uh, death and rebirth as well. Uh, and uh, in those, a lot of those texts, uh, resurrection is barely talked about, and uh, you know the point of salvation is more through the act of incarnation, meaning that uh, Christ coming down to become a human is itself um, the solution for salvation rather than Christ dying, the act of dying and being resurrected as the solution for salvation. So in the Sutra of Cost, Effect and Salvation, there was no other way to free us from sins but for him to enter the world. So he came and suffered a life of rejection and pain before returning. Again, that journey imagery. To know this is to know who he was, to know that the one sacred spirit became incarnate in that holy sacred spirit. So again, you know, incarnation. And, you know, to... This is not just because this is localized in China and, you know, addressing the Christian problems through the Buddhist or Taoist terms. That idea is also uh, developed or uh, developed earlier 
in the West as well. So one of the uh, important figures, uh, important church fathers, uh, Athanasius, talked about uh, you know God became man so that man can become God. So that is that is an idea. That's um, you know that again is very mystical and and somewhat gnostic -y kind of uh, idea, even though that is propagated by one very, I would say, very orthodox kind of church father uh, who punched uh, a heretic at a council. <laughs> uh, so, you know, these mystical ideas are there is again my message is that there's where's the line between the Austin? It was uh, Saint Nick who punched the. Um, oh, is that Saint Nick? Yeah, yeah. A Athanasius just got excommunicated, I think, five or six times. Yeah. Uh, oh. He was in, and then he was out, and then he was in, and then he was out. Right. Uh, yeah, it was Saint Nick. Did he not Arius. punch someone no, else? It was Santa Claus. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, my bad. Somebody punched someone. <laughs> Uh, so, another interesting point. In one of the texts uh, that is discovered, uh, so this is not a specifically uh, Nestorian text. It is uh, spotted in a Tibetan Buddhist text. T Tibetan Buddhism is a very specific form of Northern Buddhism, Mahayana Buddhism, which become Vajrayana Buddhism, which is also called Tantric Buddhism or Esoteric Buddhism, which has a lot of visualization practices and in particular something called Deity Yoga. It is the practice where uh, a person meditates upon or takes the identity of a specific deity uh, prescribed in those traditions. And in that particular passage that was found in the text, uh, a reference was made to Jesus Messiah in that text. Uh, and it references, it compares Jesus as Vajrapani or Sakyamuni, which is, uh, the second Sakyamuni is the Buddha, the the historical Buddha, the name, the title of the historical Buddha. So it says, man, as a human person, uh, your ally is the God called Jesus Messiah. He acts as Vajrapani and Sri Sakyamuni. When the gates of the seven levels of heaven have opened, you will accomplish the yoga that you will receive from the judge at the right hand of God. You can see that Christian imagery there um, as well. Because of this, do whatever you wish without the shame, fear, or apprehension. You will become a conqueror, and there will be no demons or abstracting spirits. Whatever casts the lot, it will be very good. So it is uh, the initiate, the aspirant is being initiated into, you know, to get into that gates of seven levels through this process of identifying oneself with uh, Jesus the Messiah. Um, so that's the interesting pieces that you know I, uh, I want to stimulate uh, your minds around. Um, and side note, where is the Church of the East now? So Church of the East, the Nestorian Church, um, of course, there is always schisms and uh, differences in philosophies. There are two or more divisions that happened and then some lineages later merged and became uh, in communion with the Roman See, which they were not before, and became Chaldean Catholic Church. So they are one of the Eastern Catholic churches. And then another lineage uh, with the more traditionalist or orthodox lines merged to become Assyrian Church of the, of the East, and they are now based in Chicago. Um, do I still have some time? Oh, yeah. yeah. All right. Yeah. This is good. And 
Any questions so far about Church of the East? Yes. So, um, first of all, this is uh, definitely stimulating my mind, mind blown in particular for a lot of this. Was, was any of the imagery that we get familiar with found with, say, the uh, historian Steely, like the uh, cross image or things of that nature carried over, or was it more, you know, the text and whatnot that you see right. in a cultural shift? Yes. There's only a lot of crosses and um, actually there is I will skip this a little bit. Uh, there is a place called Dachin Pagoda, uh, which is Roman Pagoda, so to speak. So this is a part of the monastery remains. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, this is sort of like a Buddhist pagoda that you will see in China, but it is originally an Astorian monastery. And this is not very clear, but this is supposed to be inside that, and this is a nativity scene. And there are also some tombstones uh, with a cross in it. And, and I think also in that stele, there are some uh, imagery there of the, particularly the cross and uh, stuff. Thank you. Yeah. Oops. Anything? All right. Uh, Manichaeanism in China. So Manichaeanism uh, originated around the second, first, third century, uh, around 200 with Prophet Mani. And Mani was born in nowadays Iran, so per Persia. He is, you know, he grew up in that central area where uh, there is Zoroastrianism, uh, there is Jesus was already born, Christianity, there is Judaism, and uh, have some possible contact with Buddhism as well. So, um, you know, just like Muhammad or uh, Baha'u'llah uh, in Islam and Baha'i faith, uh, Mani considered himself to be the seal of the prophets, and he is sort of re reconciling those teachings and bringing uh, things together. And you can see in his ideas uh, the influences, heavy influences from Zoroastrianism, where there is the uh, duality, two gods, um, you know, one of light, one of darkness. And you can also see a lot of Gnostic. Uh, "Quote unquote Gnostic uh, teachings that early Christianity uh, had, <clears throat> and just like those Gnostic schools, it has a very rich cosmogony. Uh, how the creation happened? It happened, in short, uh, in three episodes. In the first episode, there is light, there is darkness. They start fighting, and then second creation, there's some fighting." And then the third creation, uh, the demons started swallowing light. Um, and then demons copulated with each other, and they produced Adam and Eve. Uh, therefore, Adam and Eve uh, received those trapped light particles. And, uh, you know, they are supposed to not copulate, but they eventually copulated and created more bodies and more light is therefore trapped. Um, before that radiant Jesus, the uh, aeonic Jesus, I would say, awakens Adam to you know, remind him of his original nature. Um, so Mani is considered to be another attempt from the world of light, uh, another you know, messianic figure to liberate the uh, light particles that are trapped in the Physical bodies, as always. And uh, when Manichaeanism reached China, it, uh, <clears throat> well, initially it maintained a particular form as a foreign or Persian identity, but it also uh, transformed uh, for the reasons that I will talk about um, shortly. 
uh, you know, to be assimilated and talked about in Buddhist, Taoist, and well, Buddhist and Taoist terms, because those two traditions in particular are more spiritual than Confucianism, even though it can be spiritual. Um, so, proper money is termed Moni Guan Fo, which means Mani, the Buddha of light, comparable to the uh, salvationistic Buddha figure in uh, a specific school of Mahayana Buddhism, the Pure Land Buddhism, uh, you know, Buddha of infinite light, Amitabha. He is also considered an emanation of Lao Tzu, which is the you know, founder of Taoism, basically. Um, so he is the incarnation or reincarnation of these former teachers. So here's some, some artwork that is really uh, assimilated. This is a silk painting. The left one is a silk painting of Mani the Buddha here teaching. Here is the heavens with, uh, you know, fancy mansions and their uh, listeners and people like that. And then here you can see uh, here is the wheel of you know, death and rebirth. Um, so you can see how it is sort of um, imitating some of the, uh, adapting some of the uh, Buddhist artwork. Uh, and then this is not from China. I believe this is from somewhere India or Central Asia. This is supposed to be the Buddha of the infinite light, Amitabha Buddha in his western paradise, the pure land. But there are also uh, images of Christianity, or you know, as Manichaean uh, adopted Christianity within the theology. Uh, the cross is used there, and then there's the sun, symbol of light. Um, so those are there. And then here, this is very uh, much like a Buddha. And because this is more of a monthly uh, attire, like a robe. And this one is uh, in the style of a bodhisattva, which is the uh, being of being of wisdom, who will become a Buddha, but not yet a Buddha, but it is uh, in a fashion of a bodhisattva because it, the attire looks more princely rather than like a monk. So this, these are descriptions, uh, artwork presentations of Jesus as a Buddha. Here you will see the cross over here, and, or a bodhisattva. Here is the cross here as well. Is the cross the only thing that leads us to believe that these are representations of Jesus? And I, I think there are texts and works <coughs> attached to these. Uh, okay. Not necessarily as captions, but mm -hmm. the context of that is what's supposed to make, you know, more Jesus-y. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Jesus -y. Um, so... <laughs> What's that? Oh, just the by icky at the uh, yeah. That's... Yes, it's icky. Um, so, so there is definitely some parallels between uh, Pure Land Buddhism and Manichaeanism through the use of the you know light imagery, through the use of the light and darkness and salvation things like that. So. Uh, why is that? The Pure Land Buddhism is uh, a specific group of Mahayana Buddhism. You can think of Pure Land in contrast to Zen Buddhism. Um, Zen Buddhism, uh, you know, a lot of people know that it talks about being in the moment or being uh, observing what is there and being enlightened instantly. In contrast to that Pure Land Buddhism, the idea uh, Pure Land Buddhism, the idea of uh, sort of relying on Amitabha Buddha is that, you know, human beings are not capable of obtaining liberation by their own practice. So 
Uh, so Amitabha Buddha gives a gift of mercy to be reborn in his pure land, like a paradise, so that people can practice Dharma there and be liberated there. So it's more salvationistic than uh, other forms of Buddhism. And uh, <clears throat> and then there, and, and Mahayana Buddhism also developed some ideas uh, that are very similar to uh, the Gnostic form of creation, where there is the, uh, you know, first God and emanated and created things. Um, and in Mahayana Buddhism, there's the important teaching called three body teaching, which is there is the uh, eternal body of truth. So Amitabha Buddha is you know, one representation of that eternal body of truth. So Amitabha Buddha is not the historical Buddha, but he is the uh, spiritual Buddha. And then there's the mutual em enjoyment body, and then there is the created material body, which is the, you know, the historical Buddha is the uh, incarnation of that eternal Buddha, which is in a time and a space. Um, so in that sense, um, in that sense, that trend of thought is very much like uh, Gnostic or Platonic idea of um, creation and ascension and whatnot. Um, of course, you know there is you know different schools, different uh, Gnostic ideas have either differentiation between the duality or monistic. Uh, this is a little bit more monistic than dualistic. I yes. Can I, write, and I mean, this is a conversation that I had the better part of a decade and a half ago, uh, uh, possibly with my predecessor, possibly with somebody else, but relating the three bodies like Dharmakaya, Sambhogakaya, uh, and Nometakaya to um, pneumatic, psychic, and pilic, helic. Uh, Probably. Also, perhaps uh, uh, relating it to, for example, differences between Jesus Christ and the logos. Right. Uh, Jesus yeah. Christ. And, and then logos. Christ. Yes. You know that that kind of, that kind of thing. So stuff stuff like that. But yeah. At least the, the, that's how I remember. I I can't remember how I got into the topic or exactly who I got into it with. Yeah. Probably him, but yeah. yeah. It's definitely very similar ideas, if not the same. Uh, and I think it shows up again and again uh, you know, in one idea or the other. Mm. Were you saying something? Oh. Just um, <clears throat> so here, <laughs> uh, so at one point it's possible Buddhism, of course, was developed and spread in uh, Western India and Central Asia before the time of Mani, and he probably knew some of the ideas. Uh, so then, but at the same time, you know, as we were talking, which came first? Uh, did Buddhism contribute to the later ideas of uh, Gnostic thought? Uh, or you know, Platonic thought, or how these, how are these things related to each other? Who borrowed from what? Who adapted what? It's it's kind of hard to say. So I, you know, I just put a note. Um, but icky, uh, where the idea started, I, I don't know. Uh, and then it's also, of course, possible that different ideas through personal experience, personal gnosis, personal spiritual journey, some of these ideas might have been developed on their own, but very similar to each other, and, uh, and then communicated to other groups and compared the notes. Huh. I thought I had more slides for Manichaeanism, and apparently not, uh, because there is 
you know, what happened to Manichaeanism there is, uh, unlike the Nestorian side of things, it didn't have <coughs> specific texts that are uh, left behind. There are maybe three texts, uh, which are all in classical Chinese, so I cannot really read. Um, so I left out that uh, textual analysis part of things. So what happens uh, afterwards? Afterwards, as in after the Tang Dynasty, after the arrival and prosperity of the Nestorian Church and the Manichaean community. So the persecution happened, and uh, you know, after a century, first targeted at Buddhism, uh, but other communities were also persecuted. It was largely because of uh, you know greed for taxes as well as uh, the emperor was aging and he started, be, you know, uh, became to be jaded with Buddhism, even though it's very prevalent at that time. Uh, he didn't like the idea of nirvana or uh, you know, not being born again. He liked the idea from Taoism better to obtain immortality through elixir and alchemy and things like that. And after Tang Dynasty, uh, there is, of course, turmoil again, and then followed by another prosperous cosmopolitan metropolitan society called Song Dynasty, which is later followed by the Mongol conquest. Uh, Mongols were, of course, just like the other empires, they're religiously tolerant, more or less, and throughout the empire, there were uh, uh, Manichaean and Nestorian followers. And during that Mongol period, uh, Roman Catholicism and Islam also started arriving uh, in China. So the Jesuits in particular have been there, Marco Polo, um, and uh, Confucius was also brought back to uh, Europe. So. The interesting thing about that is that Confucius is a Latinized version of um, his title, that person's title. Uh, yeah, is Kong Fu Zi, meaning Master Kong, Kong being his uh, family name. So Kong Fu Zi, Master Kong, and with U.S. it is Latinized. Uh, during the time of Genghis Khan, the you know Mongol. Uh, Conquistador, during uh, his grandson's reign, uh, Nestorian Christianity had a great influence throughout the Mongol Empire, particularly in the Central Asia area. But shortly after that, the Mongol Empire declined, and uh, Nestorian Christianity uh, also declined with that. And Manichaeanism. <clears throat> Manichaeans were uh, also remain in China, and uh, you know they got involved with rebellions for some reason. Uh, Manichaeans and Gnostics like to rebel, <laughs> and uh, they got involved with rebellions, and then the religion was banned in uh, Ming Dynasty, which is the second last dynasty in Imperial China, and. It was also highly assimilated into the Chinese culture, uh, taking more and more of the Buddhist uh, customs and cultures. And there are supposed to be some small groups in China, China and Taiwan who practice Manichaeanism more as the um, Manichaean Buddhist tradition, so to speak. Um, and there is also said to be a Manichaean council with members in Tibet and China. I'm saying said to be because I, I only read them about them in Wikipedia and couldn't find more resources, so uh, I'm not sure about that. And uh, but the influence of Manichaeanism, of course, was larger than you know just having a church, having a community and then going underground. It left some marks behind in China. And 
with a mixture of folk religion and Buddhism and whatnot, and it contributed to creation of the secret societies like the White Lotus Society. White Lotus Society is a hybrid of Buddhist, Taoist, and uh, Manichaean ideas. Their uh, supreme deity, so to speak, the primary deity is called Wu Shan Lao Mu, which uh, means the unborn old mother or unborn venerable mother. So it's a uh, goddess sect, goddess uh, religion. And uh, you know, the White Lotus Society is one of the first early secret societies in uh, China and Chinese culture. And there's definitely a lot of other uh, you know, religions and uh, sects and schools of thought that, ha that happened afterwards. And White Lotus Society is also the forefather of what we now know as triads. So, uh, so Gnostics yeah, contributed close. into the Magenta. rise of ma mafia. Um, yes. Um, so, in uh, so another interesting thing is that uh, Manichaeans are referenced in a very popular fiction. It's it's recent fiction, so it's not uh, true, but it, it's probably, it's really interesting because I grew up with that show and I didn't know about Manichaeanism, and then later I found out that, oh, this is, these are the things. And uh, in that fiction story, fictional story, uh, Manichaeans are supposed to have a martial arts community uh, getting involved in the rebellion against the Mongols. Um, which probably is not true, uh, because later Ming Dynasty, uh, after the Mongols, the 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 empire banned Manichaeanism, uh, probably because it is foreign, probably because they are somewhat secretive and foreign ideas, and also because uh, you know they're quote-unquote violation of the imperial protocol. So in, traditionally in China, uh, the common people are not supposed to do what the emperor does. So the imperial color, for example, is yellow. And you are not supposed to, if you're a commoner, you're not supposed to wear yellow. And uh, you know, uh, if you are a certain generations apart from the emperor or imperial family, you're not supposed to wear uh, yellow, uh, but if you're within that certain generations, you can wear yellow. So things like that. So, like I said, Manichaeans were called the religion of Ming or religion of light. Uh, so that has the, the same character as the dynastic name, which is Ming Dynasty, which is the dynasty of light. So that's probably one reason that they banned Manichaeans. So breaking the imperial protocol. And that is the only term that Mani himself ever uses for his own religion. Is he only call, ever calls it the religion of light? Yeah. So so that that does seem to come directly from right from the Manichaean tradition. Yeah. Yes. Because in in uh, currently it's also called Mani mm -hmm. You know, so religion of Mani. So, um, but beginning wise. It's, and there are a few temples left in southeast uh, China, disguised as you know local Taoist or Buddhist temples. Here, it's not very clear, but this is supposed to be Mani, again in a very uh, Buddhist way of representing. With the altar, it is one of the probably the only intact. Uh, Manichaean temple in uh, southeast. And then th this is, I don't know where this is, but this is also a, supposed to be another Manichaean temple with, uh, you know, various figures and saints and whatnot. And this is the Dachin Pagoda that I talked about. So, uh, I've talked about these things. And White Lotus Society, the offshoot and precursor of the triads 
was also banned in the Manchurian em uh, Empire, which is the last dynasty in Imperial China. So it says, in the, in the law, it says all society calling themselves at random white lotus, specifically white lotus, communities of the Buddha Mitria, so it is a salvationistic, uh, you know, or as, uh, you know, the groups that are talking about the coming of the new Buddha and coming of a new age. Uh, so those communities or Manichaeans, Manichaean religion, or the schools of the white cloud, etc., together with all those carry out in deviant heretical practices, or who in secret places have prints and images, gather people by burning incense, meeting at night, dispersing by day, staring out misleading people under use the pre pretext of cultivating virtue shall be sentenced. So, uh, yeah, these people are problematic. Um, so the, the code had, you know, that kind of banned the secret societies and uh, foreign religions. And then it is said that, uh, you know, one of the other Pure Land traditions in Japan also uh, were, was influenced by uh, Manichaean thought. But again, you know, it's, is it the Buddhism influenced the Manichaean or Manichaean or, 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 or both? And in popular culture, it's the uh, story that I was talking about, the martial arts story. Uh, in, in that uh, novel, uh, the writer wrote, Let the holy fire burn our bodies into ashes. We followers of Ming Jiao, or followers of the Manichaean religion, are charged with the responsibility of rooting out evil and guarding the good. When there's no joy in the temporal world, we fear no pain in going in to the other. Everything will turn to dust with the passing of time. It's a pity that mortal people have so much to worry about. So um, it's, it's just really interesting to see you know, that kind of very in, uh, Manichaean or very Gnostic kind of ideas in popular culture even without knowing. Uh, that writer, of course, probably knew. Um, but who knew the Manichaeanism will be um, will not be an obscure religion. Um, so if you want to uh, read more about the Nestorian side of things, there is a particular book that I think is really good called The Dharma Became Flesh. Uh, I think the author is writing from a more uh, a Christian point of view, so, uh, but it's a really good textual analysis of things. There are also a couple of books called Jesus Sutras, uh, the Lost Text of Jesus, or things like that, uh, that will give you more, uh, more of those texts. And those texts are, of course, interpreted by different people to make different arguments. So some people are a little bit more um, New Age leaning. Some people a little bit more. Uh, academic, some people are a little bit more um, Buddhist or Christian leaning, so uh, you'll have to see which, you know, which uh, suits with your palate. And uh, questions? Yes? I have this question, kind of a comment. I'm not sure if I read the whole thing entirely, but we had up the sutra, the, I think it was ignorance as the basis. Uh-huh about enlightenment. Yes. And it really reminded me of one of the Logan from Gospel of Thomas. Minus the part yes. that it says that you would be disturbed and then you would know. But it um, really, I mean, I know that there's the history yeah. of the, the myth of Thomas going there and the, but I just wonder how much of those things are actually, are connected. Because right. Because that, that um, I think that was ignorance as a basis, and it was about enlightenment, and it just sounded a lot like something you read from Thomas. Yeah, and 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 like I said, I think you know even though it was later excluded, the ideas probably were there in the early Christianity. And the interesting thing is that uh, the Church of the East is said to be founded by Saint right. Thomas as right. well. So That's it's why I that was pretty and they're they're you know uh, very close to India. Uh, Thomas is supposed to have gone to India as well. So there are the flow churches. of those ideas. Yes. What's that? The Martoma churches in India. Yep. Right, especially in Goa. 
Yep. Yeah, I've read some of the, the English translations of the Jesus Sutras, and I find them quite mystical and Gnosticy. Right. And um, as you said, sometimes they're translated with a through through a, right through a lens. Um, right. But uh, I do wonder if there isn't perhaps, um, you know, a Syrian or Middle Eastern or Egyptian precursor text that they're bringing with them that, you know, and right. then, you know what I mean? It's not just coming through the, the Chinese uh, Buddhism and Taoism. Right. They're not just rewriting the Bible because a lot of the, the phrases don't have a one-to-one -one with, uh, with what we think of as the canonical Bible. Right. right? So... Sorry, I'm just making a rambly statement instead of asking you a question. But I, I you know, I, I, I have a way of theory, or I suspect maybe, maybe a, a Gnostic key group is bringing these texts to China, right? And then they're being translated and mixed in with some of the, the Buddhist thought. Yeah, when the bishop first came to uh, China, uh, I think he brought, you know, texts as well as icons with him, uh, and the the Church of the East, the Nestorian Chinese texts were written over a century or so. Some of them, the, probably the earlier ones, are more uh, Christian. You know, not the language is said to be awkward, you know, in, in Chinese. And then later ones are a little bit more uh, flowy in the local language. So, so there is that. And yeah. oh, uh, sorry, I just have one more comment. Uh, Philip Jenkins wrote a book on the Church of the East, and he's um, in that book he, he talked about that the uh, um, the Nestorian Christians. Yeah, 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 it's a great book. But he, he said the Nestorian Christians uh, that in China. Philip Jenkins time. from Penn State. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Uh, it's a great book. Yeah, so I have, um, I have the audio version of it. Yeah, I think it, it, I think yeah, I think it's the audio version I have. Good guy. Yeah. Yeah. That's, I get it. Uh... Um, anyway, see, he said that the Nestorian uh, the Christians actually helped translate the Mahayana texts because when the Buddhist missionaries came to India, to China, they were like, we need some, we need, we need experts. Like, they're, they're, they're walking mm. around, like, we need to translate this into the local language. And they're like, well, there's these Nestorian dudes, you know, they've, they've got a lot of skill in translating texts, right? Right. So, so, so Christians played an important role in spreading Buddhism. Because if those Mahayan texts had never been translated, then Mahayana right. Buddhism wouldn't have gotten spread around China. Right, right. Yeah. And in translating into Chinese, it's also interesting because both uh, Semitic languages, like mm -hmm. Syriac and Aramaic, and Indian language, Indo-European languages, have lots of syllables for one word. And usually in Chinese, it's, you know, one word is one syllable, right. so uh, instead of having to uh, adapt into uh, the foreign word into Chinese, they have to somewhat have to translate, literally translate into some uh, into a Chinese word to conform to the semantic characteristics of Chinese. I think it's 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 really interesting. Yeah. So along those lines. Gave the literal translation of God, I think. Sure. Well, I noticed here in the retelling of, 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 of Genesis that you were just at that they skip this name from the straight to Satan. Uh huh. Uh, um, so it's, I'm wondering what Satan is in Chinese. How do you translate Ooh, that? Ooh, that I didn't look at. I will look at that and get back to you. Okay. Yeah. I'd just like to note that Bray and I have regular, regular conversations that kind of go all over the place into various uh, theories and theologies and, and histories. And you've now made our kind of ongoing grand unified Gnostic theory a lot more complicated. <laughs> <laughs> well, mission accomplished. <laughs> all right, let's give it.